Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Friday morning virtual journal club. This is actually our 28th um, annual, our weekly journal club since the start of the pandemic. And I am really thrilled to introduce um, our two guests for this morning. Dr. Lori Wirth is the Elizabeth, the Elizabeth and Michael Ruane Endowed Chair of Medical Oncology and Medical Director of the Center for Head and Neck Cancers at Mass General uh, Hospital Cancer Center. She's an Associate Professor in Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Wirth really needs no introduction. She's a leading authority in advanced thyroid cancer and head and neck oncology. She has special expertise in combined modality therapy for cancers of the head and neck and immunotherapy and molecularly targeted therapies for thyroid cancer. Um, she has a busy research program that focuses on clinical trials. Um, she is also the medical director of the Center for Head and Neck Cancer with responsibilities including uh, coordinating and supporting the joint mass general and mass INEA research program in thyroid and head and neck cancers. In addition to all of that, um, she is the co-director of the Mass General Mass Ioneer Advanced Thyroid Cancer Center, and she is the former chairperson of the International Thyroid Oncology Group, a founding executive committee member of um, Thyroid International Recommendation, Recommendations Online, um, and she also sits on uh, the board of the American Society of Clinical Oncology's Education Committee, National Comprehensive Cancer Networks, a Thyroid Cancer Committee, and the ABIM Medical Oncology Board Exam Committee. Um, and so uh, we are also um, incredibly privileged to have as the discussant this morning, Dr. Alan Ho, um, who also really needs no introduction. He is a head and neck medical oncologist at Memorial Stone Kettering Cancer Center. He has um, translational research focus on thyroid cancers as well as salivary gland uh, cancers and developmental therapeutics. Alan is currently leading the Head and Neck Working Group in the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology and the Head and Neck Section of the International Rare Cancer Initiative. Um, he is also a member of the board for the International Thyroid Oncology Group and, and the NCI Head and Neck Steering Committee. Um, so this is uh, really an outstanding uh, panel here this morning. Uh, we encourage you to um, write in your questions and um, I will do my best as always to try to get to those questions. So with that, um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to introduce Dr. Lori Worth here. Thank you, Mark, um, for that very kind introduction. And it's really nice to uh, be invited to do this uh, uh, Thyroid Journal Club with everyone, um, and, and especially with Mark and Alan. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to dive in and, and talk about targeting red and thyroid cancer and the Libretto 001 trial. Um, here are my disclosures. And of course, uh, RET and thyroid cancer is not just a matter of medullary thyroid cancer, but we also see RET fusions in papillary thyroid cancers, poorly differentiated, and even anaplastic thyroid cancers. Um, RED is a proto-oncogene. It encodes a transmember receptor tyrosine kinase. It's a little bit different than the typical receptor uh, uh, tyrosine kinases because it doesn't homodimerize dimerize exactly with itself. Um, it forms a complex um, after the GDNF family ligands bind to their receptors um, and, and that uh, is a co-receptor that binds the receptor that then leads to dimerization of the of the uh, RTK and downstream activation of signaling at multiple pathways that we know and love in cancer. Um, so RET is activated in thyroid cancer via two distinct mechanisms. We see RET mutations in the cysteine-rich extracellular uh, domain of RET, and then also in the kinase domains um, of, of RET, particularly in, in MEN2B and, and somatic uh, uh, sporadic uh, uh, MTC. But we also see RET gene rearrangements um, where RET is fused with a five up five prime upstream partner, um, leading to cytosolic uh, binding and constitutive activation. Um, so both of these mechanisms lead to ligand independent sing signaling and oncogenesis in thyroid cancer. In terms of RED and MTC, uh, RET mutations drive approximately 70% of all MTCs. 
25% of MTCs are hereditary and they all essentially have germline ret mutations, but 60% of sporadic MTCs harbor somatic ret mutations. Ret M918T is the most common somatic mutation, and again, that's a mutation in the intracellular kinase domain. Um, it's also the, the mutation, the germline mutation that drives nearly all MEN2B cases. And then RET C634 is the most common hereditary mutation that's seen in MEN2A, but it can also occur somatically as well. Of course, there's a very interesting genotype phenotype correlation in MTC. Um, uh, so this slide represents um, uh, uh, MEN to A and to B, but we also see a similar genotype phenotype correlation in the sporadic cases as well. Um, but the various mutations correlate with different degrees of aggressiveness of MTC, as well as different phenotypes such as pheochromocytoma. Um, so if we take the example of MEN2B and the M918T mutation, um, those patients that har harbor that germline mutation are at the highest risk of early onset uh, medullary thyroid cancer. Um, those babies need to have a, a prophylactic thyroidectomy in the first year of life in order to prevent them from developing this cancer that might otherwise kill them. Those patients also are at high risk for developing pheochromocytoma. And then they can have, they have an interesting uh, uh, body habitus as well. So they have a marfanoid body habitus, generally a long facies, as you can see here in, in these pictures of a patient of mine below. Um, they also have aerodigestive tract ganglioneuromas that you can see here in her tongue, in her lips. There are ganglioneuromas in the conjunctiva as well. These ganglioneuromas cause um, all sorts of GI problems, particularly with GI obstruction. She's had multiple surgeries uh, for bowel obstruction. You can see here on the CT scan, she's got some dilated loops of bowel. You can also see uh, she doesn't have adrenal glands because she had bilateral adrenalectomy for bilateral pheochromocytomas. In terms of the ret fusions that we see in thyroid cancer, um, less than 10% of papillary thyroid cancers harbor ret fusions. Um, the ret fusions are more frequent in pediatric and young adult papillary thyroid cancers, and then even more frequent in cancers that are radiation-induced, such as the, by the Chernobyl accident. The CCDC6 uh, RET is the most common fusion seen in thyroid cancer, and the second most common one is NCOA4. But it's important to be aware of the fact that more than 25 prime fusion partners have now been described in thyroid cancer alone with RET. And so when you're testing a patient for uh, 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 RET fusions, you want to make sure that your assay can pick up um, uh, the large number of RET fusions, not just the most common two or three. So we do have multikinase inhibitors with red activity that are approved um, in, uh, in thyroid cancer, lenvatinib, cabozatinib, vandatinib. And these kind of kinome dendrograms here show how these multikinase inhibitors inhibit not just RET or VEGFR2, um, so the green dots are RET, um, and the, the size of the dot correlates with the strength of inhibition. Um, and so they all have red activity, but multiple other kinases as well. The blue dots here show uh, VEGFR2. We now, however, have two RET-specific agents um, that have uh, completed their first in human trials, sulfurcatinib or loxo-292 and pralsatinib or BLU-667. So this kinome dendrogram here on the right shows how it, uh, this is sulfurcatinib, but a, a, a very similar one would be done for pralsatinib. Um, you can see that, it's the, that the drugs are very highly selective for RET very potent and have very little other uh, kinase inhibition. So both of the agents were designed to inhibit the wild type RET kinase that we see in the fusions that drive thyroid cancers and non-small cell lung cancer, as well as all of the <clears throat> known oncogenic RET mutations in medullary thyroid cancer, including RET V804, which we now know is an acquired gatekeeper resistance mutation that emerges on treatment with cabozatinib and vandatinib. Um, both of these drugs were also designed as 
to have as, a, as, as little activity as possible against VEGFR2 um, because we really think that it's the KDR VEGFR2 inhibition that causes a lot of the toxicity profile of the multikinase inhibitors. Um, so basically the idea is that the efficacy of the other MKIs is probably limited in RET-driven cancers by insufficient RET inhibition because of the toxicity from the off-target effects. So the Libretto 001 trial was the first trial reported looking at a RET-specific therapy. Um, this was a phase 1-2 trial of selpercatinib in RET-driven non-small cell lung cancer, RET-driven thyroid cancers, and other RET-driven cancers. Overall, there were 531 patients that were enrolled. There were three thyroid cohorts, and those are the, the data that I'm going to show you. Um, <clears throat> the first cohort, which was considered the primary analysis set, was in patients with MTC with RET mutations that had been previously treated with vandetinib and or cabozantinib. And then there was a RET mutant MTC cohort of patients that had not received prior vandetinib or cabozantinib. And then there was a RET fusion positive previously treated follicular derived thyroid cancer cohort. So this uh, table here shows the three thyroid cancer cohorts. I'm sorry, I know the text is very small. <clears throat> But in the primary analysis set, there were 55 patients. 60% of those patients had a RET M918T mutations. 13% had extracellular cysteine-rich domain mutations. Both familial and sporadic patients were enrolled. And then in the RET mutant MTC patients that had not previously received cabozantinib or vandetinib, there were 88 patients enrolled. And then we had 19 patients in the RET fusion-positive thyroid cancer cohort, in terms of the histologies, we had patients with PTC, poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, anaplastic thyroid cancer, and even Herthel cell thyroid cancer. The CCDC6 RET fusion um, was the most common fusion seen, and then NCOA4 was the second most common, which was as expected. And there were patients also of note that had the RET V804 mutations as well. In terms of the safety profile in the thyroid patients, the table here shows the AEs that were reported in 15% of patients or more. Um, you can see on the table that most of the adverse events are grade one and grade two, but when we drill down and look at treatment-related grade three and grade four adverse events, which is really what we care about most in terms of drug-related toxicity, um, the numbers are, are fairly small here. The most common uh, uh, treatment-related grade three and grade four AEs were hypertension, transaminitis, and diarrhea. There were 30% of patients overall in the entire trial that had dose reductions due to treatment-related adverse events, and 2% two, two of patients overall in the entire trial had discontinuation of sulpercatinib due to treatment-related adverse events. These waterfall plots show the efficacy in the two MTC cohorts. So the waterfall plot on the top shows the previously treated uh, uh, RET mutant MTC patients. Um, the uh, bars are color coded for the very for the patients that have been uh, treated with vandetinib in light blue, cabozantinib in green, or purple uh, with both. Which I like that political analogy. Um, anyway, so. Um, the primary, the primary endpoint was objective response rate by RESIST. This was determined by an independent review committee. And in the patients that had been previously treated, we saw an overall response rate of 69%, and 9% of patients had complete responses. In the RET mutant uh, MTC patients who had not previously received cabozantinib or vandetinib, um, in the waterfall plot down here, we had you can see an overall response rate of 73%, with 11% of patients having a complete response. Um, these plots don't show, don't aren't coded for the various rep mutations that, that um, uh, were enrolled in the trial, um, but responses were seen across all rep mutations in the patients that were enrolled, including the RET V804 gatekeeper resistance mutation. These Kaplan-Meier curves show the median duration of response and progression-free survival for the primary analysis set, neither one of which had have yet been reached at a median follow-up of 14.1 months and 16.7 months, respectively. 
Here we see the um, efficacy of, of selpercatinib in the RET fusion positive thyroid cancer patients. Um, so the waterfall plot here um, is color coded for the histologies. So papillary thyroid cancer poorly differentiated in red. We had two anaplastic thyroid cancer patients in yellow, and then one patient with fertile cell thyroid cancer. Overall, in these patients, there was um, an overall response rate of 79%, with a median duration of um, uh, response being 18.4 months. And I would like to point out here that this anaplastic patient of mine, or is a, is a patient of mine um, who I know and love well. Um, and he's still doing well, and he has bona fide uh, 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 reviewed by several uh, 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 pathologists anaplastic thyroid cancer. So anyway, it was on the basis of these results that selpercatinib was approved by the FDA for RET-driven lung and thyroid cancers. Um, this is a line agnostic approval in both lung cancer and in, in, in thyroid cancers, um, including MTC and follicular-derived thyroid cancer. So does that really nice adverse event uh, uh, profile correlate with, uh, with what patients experience? Um, we did take a look at, at patient reported outcomes in the Libretto 001 trial, and this slide here shows PROs that were reported recently at ESMO. Um, so uh, patients received uh, questionnaires, uh, the EORTC, QLQ C30, and then we also did a special diarrhea tool, the MSTIDAT. And um, so what you can see just overall is um, in, in, in this busy chart, the gray represents patients who remain stable in that domain. Blue represents patients that improved in the domain. And then orange represents patients that got worse in that domain. And so you can see that a lot of patients remain stable in these, side of, in, in these symptoms or, or actually improved. So here with the QLQC30 with diarrhea, for example, you can see that almost half of patients um, improved in terms of their diarrhea um, as reported in that tool. Um, and then um, the other, uh, another significant percentage of patients uh, remain stable over time. Um, other GI side effects that, that um, patients were asked about, nausea and vomiting, appetite loss are here as well. Overall patients remaining stable or improvement um, with a small subset of patients having, having worsening over time. Um, the other thing that I uh, found interesting was this uh, uh, reporting of pain. Um, and we did see a lot of patients, 38% of patients re reporting an improvement in pain over time, which I think is very encouraging. Um, we saw with the MSTIDAT tool, and um, we saw a similar amount of improvement or even perhaps a little bit more with that diarrhea specific tool. Um, so 80% of patients overall at baseline reported uh, having diarrhea. Um, that's um, the green line here, um, whereas the bars show patients that reported severe diarrhea. It's the percentage of these patients that had severe diarrhea. So a lot of patients have severe diarrhea at the time of study entry, and the diarrhea overall, as well as um, very severe diarrhea, improved over time and actually remained improved um, over the course of, of, of uh, treatment on trial. Um, so, so I think overall, um, uh, these PROs are, are very encouraging. And I would just like to say that, you know, diarrhea is one of the things that um, uh, many MTC patients really live with for a long time. Um, and, it, it, you know, we don't, I think, understand um, all the time how much um, those kinds of side effects really impact on, on patients' lives. You know, our ability to sit down with our family and, and chow down a meal and chit and chat at the same time um, and then get up and go on about our business um, is, is something that we really take for granted. Our patients that live with, with severe diarrhea related to MTC really have significant impact on their day-to-day -day lives in major ways with just the simple pleasures of life like meals, but also just being able to function at home, function out in public with their friends, um, and, 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 and also function in work. Um, so, uh, anyway, I have a case that I wanted to share with everyone. This is a 57-year-old man um, who 
presented at Mass General for a second opinion in October of, of 2018. He initially presented in May of 2018 with a right neck mass that was uh, MTC on FNA. He had a total thyroidectomy, bilateral, central, and upper neck, uh, medi upper mediastinal neck dissections. Um, he had um, uh, kind of nasty pathology, um, extensive uh, intrathyroidal uh, spread of the MTC with angio invasion and extrathyroidal extension, multiple uh, positive margins. Um, he had numerous nodes um, bilaterally. Um, Postoperatively, he had a metastatic workup that showed liver lesions that were MTC on biopsy. Um, the outside uh, program sent Foundation 1 NGS testing off. And you can see here that the patient had a RET M918T mutation that was found, as well as, as um, CC. DCN1 mutations and um, FGFR amplification. So at the outside program, he was enrolled on a clinical trial investigating um, uh, combination immunotherapy in thyroid cancers. He had one dose of combination immunotherapy and developed autoimmune hepatitis and pancreatitis. So his treatment on this trial had to be discontinued. Shortly thereafter, he presented with diplopia and brain MRI showed a left cavernous sinus mass that was treated with SRS. Then in August of 2018, he started on cabozatinib, 60 milligrams every day. And on his first restaging in October, he had progressive disease with really diffuse um, disease in the spine that you can see here on this MRI, as well as the li uh, diffuse liver uh, metastasis. His calcitonin had gone up as well from 101 in August to 276 in October. And you know, you can note that those calcitonin levels seem really low compared to the extent of disease that this man has. And that um, um, when the uh, calcitonin is low out of proportion to disease really um, is seen in, some, in, in patients with really aggressive disease, unfortunately which is what this guy had. So he came to our center and in November of 2018, he had a perform ECOG performance status of one. He had grade three transaminitis and grade two hyperbilirubinemia, um, which was due to his disease progression, not the autoimmune uh, hepatitis that had um, previously resolved. So he was ineligible to participate in both the Libretto 001 and the ARO trials, which was looking at um, BLU-667 or, or prosatinib. So we pursued a single patient protocol throughout LOX Oncology and the FDA for this gentleman. Um, we also ruled out a germline mutation. It would be pretty unusual for somebody in their 50s to be diagnosed with MEN2B, but th that's one of those things that you don't want to miss, particularly in somebody that has children like he did, and he uh, fortunately was negative. While we were um, getting this single patient uh, protocol approved, his condition rapidly deteriorated. Um, he developed nausea, vomiting, and encephalopathy. Um, we were, however, able to get the SPP approved through LOXO, through the FDA, and through our IRB. And he started at a 50% of the recommended phase two dose because of his liver dysfunction. On November 28th, 2018, and I say that date because that was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Um, he came into clinic in a stretcher. Um, uh, he was, as I said, encephalopathic. Um, we figured out a way to get the drug in him um, and um, he did remarkably well. And I, if he had not started on therapy that day before Thanksgiving, I'm really not sure he would have. we would have been able to get him through the long weekend and start the treatment um, uh, the next day, I mean, the next, the next week. Um, and he had a beautiful response. Um, his condition rapidly improved. Um, he walked into clinic the next week uh, when we had him uh, scheduled closely for close follow-up. Um, on his first restaging, he did have improvement in the liver lesions. It was a 15% improvement by resist on the first restaging. And you can see here in his spine that a lot of those lytic lesions had become sclerotic. And he had a beautiful response in his tumor markers with his calcitonin at baseline from going from 434 to less than five um, and CEA dropping from 135 to 1 1.6. So his response lasted for 17 months, and then unfortunately he developed brain metastases. At that time, his calcitonin and CEA levels had increased as well. So we actually tried to increase him from the recommended phase two dose um, up to, so recommended phase two dose is 160 milligrams BID, 
we increased him to the highest dose that was studied in the phase one study, which was 240 milligrams VID. He tolerated it fine, um, but he didn't have a response in the brain. So he went on to receive whole brain radiation. We'd also sent off GARDEN 360 liquid biopsy to see if we could detect the um, explanation for his um, for his acquired resistance in the brain. We, we, he didn't have progression systemically, so we didn't have any systemic lesions that were good targets for biopsy. And unfortunately, GARDEN 360 did not show any of the um, acquired resistance mutations that have now been characterized in uh, patients um, with RET-specific therapy, uh, particularly in the solvent um, kinase front at G810, um, which is seen in 10% of patients that develop resistance um, on RET-specific um, uh, therapies. That G810 mutation, um, as I said, is in the kinase solvent front, and so it's modeled here, and you can see here that um, it blocks sulfurcatinib getting into the kinase domain, um, and that's why um, those patients who develop that resistance uh, mutation are no longer sensitive to sulfurcatinib. Um, we've also seen acquired MET amplification in 15% of patients who develop resistance, and um, acquired KRAS amplification has seen in one case, um, but we did not find any of those uh, acquired res resistance mutations in our patient. Um, he did go on to enroll in the first next generation RET specific inhibitor trial. Um, this is a drug called TPX0046. Um, it's a novel, potent RET and SARC specific inhibitor. Um, it's a small, compact uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, so it's a lot smaller um, than drugs like sulpercatinib, prosetinib, or our multikinase inhibitors. And it was designed um, to inhibit wild type RET. SARC, and then also uh, uh, RET with a uh, kinase solvent front mutation, G810. Um, so ask me in a couple of months how the patient is doing. I'm hoping that he's doing well, um, but we will find out. So I think that, oh, I do have one more slide that I, I did want to share with everyone. Um, this also um, pertains to future directions in, in terms of RET-specific therapy and, and thyroid cancer. Um, the Libretto 531 trial um, has now opened to accrual. Um, so this is, a, I think, a very important um, multicenter randomized international phase three trial comparing sulpercatinib um, in patients with, with metastatic, RET-positive, untreated medullary thyroid cancer to physician's choice, vandetinib or cabozatinib. Um, patients will be randomized in a two-to-one ratio, sulpercatinib to, to physician's choice, vandetinib or cabozatinib. And the primary endpoint of, of this trial is an interesting, uh, I think, novel endpoint of treatment failure-free survival, um, which is a combination of not only progression-free survival, but also treatment failure due to um, treatment-related adverse events. Um, patients who do meet that endpoint will be unblinded, and those patients that are on vandetinib or cabozatinib will be allowed. I'm sorry, there's not the trial is not blinded. Um, this is an unblinded trial. But anyway, when patients do have disease progression, those that are on vandetinib or, or cabozatinib will be allowed to cross over and receive sulpercatinib. Um, so um, um, this is the trial is open at a number of centers in the U.S., but also internationally. All right, so let me just conclude uh, 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 briefly. We do have multiple multikinase inhibitors that target RET. Um, however, the off-target toxicity really does impact on quality of life for our patients, and I think probably also is the one thing that limits the efficacy of these drugs in RET-driven cancers. Um, the RET gene-specific therapy demonstrates potent efficacy, and I really do think improved tolerability in RET-driven thyroid cancers. Um, I really think that this is now a emerged as a new standard of care. And our challenge now um, is that we really need to identify all of the patients that do have RET-driven thyroid cancer so that we can get them on um, uh, these uh, new novel therapies. The em emergence of acquired resistance um, is our new problem in the field, um, but unfortunately um, we already have clinical trials underway trying to tackle that problem. All right, with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you very much. Hey, Alan, have at me. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so 
it's really not going to be that kind of discussion to get a presentation. <laughs> um, because as, as, you, as you all have seen, the, the data is quite quite good. And, uh, and um, this is an incredibly important study. Uh, and the development of this drug is an important uh, drug for the field. And certainly agree that this represents a new um, standard of care for red altered tumors. Um, and so what I thought I'd do is just kind of discuss uh, not so much some of the finer details of the data that uh, uh, Dr. Worth just reviewed, but just put it in the context of uh, what the previous standard therapies were, were the concomitant uh, development of prosetinib, which is the, the blueprint medicine, red selective uh, drug, a little bit on resistance, and then uh, touch upon other clinical settings where uh, these, these drugs might have some use. And so these are my disclosures. So this is uh, really the, the kinome profile that uh, Lori uh, showed during her presentation just in numbers. And indeed, you know, much of the success of the new selective RET inhibitors are related uh, to really this achievement in, in drug chemistry and really uh, developing these drugs in, with uh, the structure of RET uh, particularly in mind. And we'll kind of discuss that in, in a little bit of uh, detail in one of the other slides. So here are it, it, the comparisons between the kind of dirtier RET kinase inhibitors that were previously the standard cabozantinib and pantetinib. Pralcetinib or blue 667 is the blueprint medicine selective inhibitor and sulfocatinib. And kind of as you saw, you know, the secret to these drugs is really the potency in which they're able to inhibit wild type RET, rearranged RET, and these mutant RET compared to cabozantinib and pantetinib. The 804 uh, gateway mutation again, um, is a mechanism of resistance to the to to vandetinib and cabozetinib primarily by blocking access to the ATP binding cleft. And here you can see again, sulfurcatinib uh, uh, and calcetinib uh, can inhibit that uh, that that target. And in, and the lessons that we've learned from targeted therapy, particularly BRAF uh, targeting therapy, we know that every percentage point increase in pathway inhibition that you can achieve really translates to meaningful clinical outcomes. But what's even more important about the development of these drugs is the selectivity here. And uh, as represented by the higher IC50s you see with Megafar 2. So only by being more potent against the target that you're, you're, you're looking to inhibit and then uh, not inhibiting off-target uh, off kinases do you get the therapeutic window that allows you to achieve the clinical outcomes that, uh, that Lori just reviewed with you. And so just, you know, by way of introduction, the, the the, um, the the previous the FDA approved the other FDA approved agents here are vandetinib and cabozantinib, both of which were evaluated in two phase three randomized clinical trials with progression free survival as being the primary endpoint. Both of them meeting that endpoint. Um, interestingly, uh, ret uh, mutation status was checked in these trials, but not for all patients. And really, uh, the, the the labeled indication for both of these drugs is independent of genomic uh, selection. So uh, apart from the fact that all comers had uh, an improvement in progression-free survival in both these studies that led to its approval, subset analyses of those that were uh, genomically profiled did show uh, increased or enhanced benefit in the RET-positive uh, uh, RET mutant uh, cohorts, particularly the M918T. Uh, Steve Sherman updated the results of the Catalyzatinib trial, which interestingly did not have crossover, so they could actually look at survival endpoints. And while the all-comers analysis didn't give the statistically significant improvement in survival they were looking for, this was a secondary objective, they did see that uh, improvement in the N918T uh, red mutant population. So when you kind of just stack side by side uh, a comparison of the phase three data from Vandetinib and Catalyzatinib for medullary uh, thyroid cancer, um, and um, and look at it compared to salvercatinib and of course pralcetinib. And this the pralcetinib data was presented by Mimi Wu at uh, at Ansible's annual meeting uh, this year. Across the board, you can see improvements with 69% uh, and 60% overall response rates compared to 45% and 28% with cabozantinib, and then also higher one-year PFSs. You can see that the estimated one-year PFS for vandetinib was was also quite high. But you know, some of the caveats to these kind of comparisons is to understand that the Van Detnip study uh, did not uh, uh, select for progressive disease. And so indeed, the median PFS on the placebo arm of that trial was nearly 19 months. So some of these things are not comparable. And again, you could also argue, are these response rates or efficacy endpoints comparable? Because indeed, um, the, the more selective RET inhibitor studies sele selected for RET mutant disease 
while vendetinib, cabozantinib is an amalgam of RET mutants and non-mutant uh, tumors. And indeed, you know, there's a higher response rate in, in the RET mutant patient population in a, about, in, for vendetinib, about 50 so percent, and in the, in the 30 to 40 percent range uh, for, for cabozantinib. Uh, so, so, there, there are, so those are some caveats when you look at those comparisons. Um, where also these selective RET inhibitors really shine is when you kind of go into the grade three AEs. Now, the rates of grade three AEs, which are reported irregardless of drug uh, attribution, um, look about similar. But you know, when you come down to those that we know are related to the GFRTKIs, but in particular, a high grade diarrhea, high grade rash, fatigue, and ischemia. We're, we're much improved in, in the breast selective inhibitor uh, uh, drugs compared to vandetinib and cabozantinib. There was a higher rate of uh, unattributed hypertension in the sulfocatinib arm, and it's hard to, to delineate if that was a patient selection issue. And then what it comes down to is really these bottom two. How often did these patients need dose reductions, and how often did they need to discontinue due to drug toxicities alone? And you can see the, the rates in the teens for both vandetinib and cabozantinib and really extremely low rates of drug discontinuation due to toxicities, kind of in keeping with the fact that these are really selective drugs and patients are tolerating these therapies. And having used these uh, treatments and, and seeing these patients in clinic, very consistent with, um, you know, not only the impressive activity, but what's really more impressive is really how well tolerated the drugs are. As I mentioned, the caveats is that you're kind of comparing apples to oranges when looking at the medullary thyroid cancer data in, Van, in vandetinib cabo versus the, the newer RET inhibitors. Uh, but uh, Vivek Subaya, who, who had uh, written the, the very nice JCO review of this topic, kind of pointed out that one comparison that could be made to, to, to kind of compare apples to apples is the data that's been uh, that has been generated with these drugs and RET rearranged non-small cell lung cancer. Indeed, the sulfocatinib um, uh, uh, data in, in that patient population led by Alex Drillin was also published in the New England Journal in the same issue as, as Dr. Wirth's uh, report. And so when you do that comparison within RET rearranged non-small cell lung cancer, again, you can see the superiority of the selective RET inhibitors um, um, in, a, in a more clear way with higher rates of response compared to bandetinib and cabozatinib studies and longer uh, disease control and median progression-free survival. So I think, you know, both by, um, you know, qualitative and quantitative evidence, it's quite clear that when you're trying to target RET in solid tumors, whether it be non-small cell lung cancer or in uh, medullary uh, thyroid cancer, um, and as I'll show you in, in a minute, in RET rearranged thyroid cancer, uh, there's greater clinical efficacy and a better side effect than toxicity profile with these drugs. So the question then becomes that we've We've got two great drugs now with sulfocatinib and uh, calcetinib. Are there differences between the two? And frankly, when you look at the data, both in what's been published with, uh, with sulfocatinib and what's been presented in calcetinib, it's really kind of hard to distinguish major differences. When you look at the overall response rates, they're, they're, they're quite close. You know, there's a slight edge to sulfocatinib in some of these categories for the previously treated medullary thyroid cancers, the treatment naive medullary thyroid cancers, or the fusion uh, positive. Uh, follicular cell-derived ones. There's an advantage in complete response rate, it looks like, with, cell, with a trend towards sulfocatinib or one-year PFS, but these are razor-thin differences uh, to, 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 and, and hard ones to really kind of be definitive about uh, differences in efficacy. When you look at uh, toxicity, again, you know, both drugs are very well tolerated um, and, and, and logs better than Capazan and Benvev as, as, as we experience in, in, in the clinic. Uh, what's interesting is the rates of rate of specific grade three treatment related AEs have slight differences between the two, with maybe slightly higher rates of of, of uh, hepatotoxicity that's been seen with sulfocatinib at these higher doses, or, and and more uh, and a little bit more in terms of uh, bone marrow toxicities with calcetinib. But again, you can see these are really single digit percentage uh, type uh, events, um, and uh, really hard to say how much different the toxicity profiles are between these two drugs. So an interesting kind of uh, uh, thought experiment here as well is, or not thought experiment, but you know, uh, thought about drug development for the field in general is, um, you know, when is randomization necessary? You know, Dr. Worth just, just showed you the, uh, the, the, the ongoing randomized study comparing um, uh, Lassa 292 to Cabazantinib and Vendetinib. 
And indeed, we're seeing more and more now examples where specifically for rare cancer uh, subsets or genomically selected patient populations, where randomization is by the FDA is not thought to be necessary for, uh, for approval. And the, this kind of the justification for some of these type of approaches is listed here. This was actually taken from a clinical cancer research uh, commentary from the FDA when the drug Vismotigib uh, for basal cell carcinomas, which targets a hedgehog pathway, uh, put out to kind of justify and, and provide the reasoning behind the approval of that drug in just a single arm phase two trial. And what they identified was the data for, the, for this phase two study was, it was independently verified, very robust with durable tumor shrinkage. Had it, and, and they also pointed out that it was a very well uh, reasoned biologic rationale at, at activation of a pathway and a drug that inhibits that pathway. They pointed out that it was a, the data demonstrated the drug was quite tolerable. And then also of critical importance is the rarity of that disease and the lack of other therapies, making the conduct of a randomized trial impractical. And this in, it has increasingly become uh, the case, even for head and neck cancers, the approval of semiclomab for cutaneous squamous cell uh, uh, carcinoma with a, a single arm uh, uh, phase two trial. And now with uh, indications for tumor agnostic indications, whether it be for tumor mutational burden, anti-PD-1 therapy, um, or um, you know, uh, MSI high tumors uh, for, for the same, uh, track inhibitors. So, you know, we're increasingly approving these drugs and using this drug based on single arm phase two, phase two data. This is a, a very interesting kind of opinion piece or commentary from these organ health and science uh, uh, ho uh, hospital uh, investigators who kind of challenge the idea about whether or not uh, randomization is required. And here specifically, they're talking about sulfur catnip in ret rearranged non-small cell lung cancer, not measured thyroid thyroid cancer. But they, they put the devil ad, advocate uh, uh, perspective about, well, what size of benefit do we see in single arm trials is going to be enough to say randomization is really not required. And, you know, they put it to the extreme of what they term parachute size benefit. Is the benefit that you see in a single arm trial really um, uh, uh, to the degree that it's comparable to the benefit that you have of giving someone who's jumping out of an airplane to prevent death with a parachute, with which, which they put close to 100%. Um, and so they point out specifically in the data for sulfur catnip and re rearranged non small cell lung cancers that uh, older retrospective data that was published by Alex Drill and a colleague of mine at Memorial that you know, even chemotherapy with chemotrex that seemed to have pretty good rates of response and median progression free survival in that comparison. And so in, in this commentary, they're arguing that even though it's a rare disease population and given the promise of the data, they would support random, uh, randomized comparison. Uh, for sulfur catnip in, in particular, um, as Dr. Worth showed, we have Libretto 531 for medullary thyroid cancer, looking at this in, in a randomized uh, setting, as well as in the ret rearranged non small cell lung cancer, co we're comparing it to chemotherapy plus, plus or minus uh, PD1. But importantly, of course, both of the uh, sulfur catnip has already been approved for each of these indications in the US, and this is really to kind of meet regulatory requirements in non, uh, non US sites. For my, for my, in my opinion, the data that we see in the single arm trials for medullary thyroid cancer and differentiated thyroid cancer with sulfur catnip and prasetinib does not require randomization. The degree of benefit that we've seen is quite high and, and, and the tolerability is quite low. And indeed, you know, it, um, um, there are some challenges to doing these kinds of randomized comparisons in the US when you've got data like that. Um, and certainly, I think, uh, you know, these mechanisms uh, for approval and getting drugs to patients, particularly with rare diseases, is an important mechanism to really stimulate research uh, for, those, for those patients. You know, Dr. Worth pointed out uh, the, the mechanism of acquired resistance. These are those, the same response waterfall plots uh, from the self catnip study and the calcetinib study. These are color-coded by the mutation type. And I bring this up not only to demonstrate, you know, the wide activity across different breast mutations, but also to point out that gateway, uh, gate, the, the gatekeeper mutation, B804, uh, in green here, and really the responses that we're seeing. So kind of matching the preclinical data that they would expect clinical activity with sulfocatinib in that group. And then here for prosetinib in the black, you can see, again, good uh, tumor reductions among those. So they were successful in developing these drugs in a rational way to overcome a known acquired resistance mechanism to that cabazantinib. But as Dr. Worth pointed out, um, while gateway um, mutations are not really an, an issue with these drugs, solvent front mutations are. And these are mutations that are really uh, at the sites of drug binding and, 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 
prevent uh, uh, good drug binding uh, of both salpicatin and prasetinib to, to RET. Um, in this report from Vivek Subai, a really nice paper that was just uh, released in the Annals of Oncology, they found several uh, solvent front mutations as well as a mutation in the hinge region just, below, just on the C-terminal end of the, the transmembrane domain with required resistance both in preclinical models and then also demonstrating um, uh, the emergence of these both in medullary thyroid cancer and a non-small cell lung cancer patient. They also did really nice crystal structure work to demonstrate the mechanism by which these mutations really uh, mediate resistance, specifically uh, the fact that both calcetinib and salvacatinib differ from bandetin and cabazatin in the way that they bind, uh, bind red. And those contact points and the ability to avoid the gateway, uh, the gatekeeper um, uh, regions is, is the reason why they're able to overcome mutations at that site and yet are still susceptible to solvent front mutations. And you can see this is just in vitro data demonstrating that in the medullary cancer setting, uh, they, uh, a salpicatinib can overcome the gateway mutation to inhibit uh, uh, red, the red signaling, uh, but not so with the solvent front mutations. And the same, uh, and, the, and the same over here uh, with regards to that hinge, uh, hinge region uh, mutation. So reprofiling these patients, re, um, reanalyzing uh, right, uh, mutation status is going to be quite important. But, and why it's this is exactly what uh, Dr. Worth had, had pointed out about second generation drugs. So we're really following the pathway of how track in inhibitor uh, development has gone, health inhibitor development has gone, where we've got really effective drugs anticipating secondary resistance, developing the drugs to inhibit that. What's interesting about TPX0046, which she, which she discussed, is the way that it binds uh, RET, as you can see in comparison to LOXO 292, Blue 667, um, and, and, and RET, is that while we can overcome these solvent front mutations, in fact, it actually is, is not quite good at, at, at inhibiting the, the gatekeeper mutations. So this really speaks to how these drugs need to be used in a biologically rational way and in, in different people. So just to finish up, uh, as Gloria mentioned, there have also been seen that amplification mechanisms resistance in non-small cell lung cancer. And in fact, there was also a report where in four patients um, uh, in, in this uh, clinical cancer research where they had treated some of these patients with sulfocatinib in combination with prazotinib to overcome uh, MET activation. Uh, and seeing some, activ some activity in some of, those, some of those patients. So again, a biologic rat, a reason for, for the acquired resistance mutation. The one caveat to the MET amplification is independent of acquired uh, mutations in RET. The applicability of these findings in, in non small cell lung cancer may not be the same uh, in, in medullary thyroid cancer. We know that there are lineage specific reasons or ways that acquired mutations in parallel pathways occur. And so, uh, really, study specifically in the medullary thyroid cancer uh, patient is going to be necessary. And of course, as mentioned, KRAS amplification has also been implicated um, and all these other pathways. Related to bandetin and cabozantin resistance, do they have relevance to these new inhibitors? Uh, remains to be understood. And just in, in, in one minute, I just have two, two more slides. The other question that remains for the field is given the outstanding results with these drugs, can we apply them in other clinical settings? And so this is a case report from Maria, Maria Cabanillas at MD Anderson and others, where they utilize um, sulfurcatinib as a neoadjuvant approach. Uh, for a patient with a really aggressive metastatic disease, tremendous response, and then allow them to kind of consolidate local control by taking them to, to thyroidectomy and bilateral neck and even metastinal node de dissection. And so can we use this in the new adjuvant setting for really advanced patients? Or is there, is there also a way that we can demonstrate benefit to the use of these in the adjuvant setting, which really, of course, is, is an area that's not really been developed for medullary thyroid cancer or really for uh, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer. And then lastly, this is a, a New England Journal report uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the, the loxotrack inhibitor, larotrectinib, and the ability to inhibit um, that recept uh, our receptor tyrosine kinase and how it reinduces redifferentiation. For those of you that are familiar, you know, we've developed some drugs that can, that can redifferentiate REI refractory thyroid cancers um, uh, to REI sensitive with downstream pathway inhibitors like BRAF inhibitors or MEK inhibitors. This is a, 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 an interesting report in that this was the first to demonstrate that a, a drug targeting an RTK like TRAP could reinduce these. Is this applicable to rep rearranged uh, thyroid cancers and, and be selected for rep inhibitors is a question. So just final conclusions, selvacatinib uh, is the new standard option for rep mutant medullary thyroid cancer and rep rearranged thyroid cancers. 
Um, when we compare between the two new selective inhibitors, we have two great drugs, both of which have really high efficacy and really low and great toxicity profiles. We have to be vigilant about mechanisms of acquired resistance and, and, and really be characterized them to really develop the new or second generation uh, of drug therapies uh, for these patients. Um, and uh, concepts to evaluate how we use these new effective drugs in other clinical settings uh, really uh, should be considered. And so that's all I have in terms of uh, discussing uh, the data, happy to take questions. That's awesome, thank you. Alan, um, you've introduced a new um, uh, entertainment for us uh, for future uh, Drupal Club, so thank you. We may call upon you uh, for, for that. Uh, um, once again, thank you. Uh, that was not nearly as scathing an, an attack on Lori as I expected. Um, Lori, do you have any comments on Alan's uh, uh, discussion here? Alan did a fine job. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious, I have a, I have a question, um, or are there other questions that we should need to prioritize? Um, you know, so Alan, should we be thinking about sequencing these drugs? You know, is there a reason to think that we should, should consider using a non-selective uh, MKI first um, and then using a, a, a RET-selective therapy? Um, or the other way around, is there a good rationale? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think just based upon the mechanisms of resistance that occur, you, uh, an argument could be made for that. You know, for instance, if you were in, you, if you really wanted to kind of do things in sequence and extend the long time that people are on drug therapy and people who are 804 naive and giving them uh, the non-selected and, 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 then, and then giving them opportunity to get that and knowing that because you know what's impressive about the data with salpicatinib is just the fact that the activity is so well preserved in the in the second line, um, and then going on to those that, that address patients. But the issue is that the toxicity profiles are so different, uh, you know, and it makes it very difficult uh, for one to really advocate using the non-selectives. I, I think the difference is that stark. So even though there may be a rationale of thinking about this, you know, biologically about the mechanism of resistance and trying to, you know, kind of do things in sequence as, as best as one can, um, it's tough not just to recommend, you know, sulfocadinib or eventually prosetinib when, 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 when approved um, uh, as even first-line therapy for these patients. So. Yeah, um, thank you. Towards that end, um, Laura, you mentioned dose escalation in those who have developed um, resistance. Is, is that a legitimate approach here, or should you be thinking, or should we be thinking about um, changing to a different um, drug at that point? Well, it didn't work in my guys. So, um, so the the rationale for increasing the dose in in that particular patient that I that I um, told you about was because he had a CNS only progression. He remained in response systemically, and so the idea was that um, we do know that there's CNS penetration of both sulpercatinib and prosatinib. There are patients um, um, on both of the trials that had brain mets that responded to both of the drugs, um, but it, you know our. I, I, I thought it's possible that he's breaking through in the brain because there isn't enough CNS penetration. And so can we improve that by increasing the dose? Um, the highest dose was 240 milligrams um, BID of sulpercatinib in the phase one dose escalation part of the trial. And um, it was the recommended phase two dose of 160 milligrams BID was selected, not because there was more toxicity in that 240. 40 milligram um, cohort, but because um, all of the, because there were, we were seeing great response rates at 160, um, the PKs um, suggested that you had more than adequate RET inhibition um, with, at that dose level. Um, and there had been some other um, DLTs um, at 160 milligrams. Um, so I wouldn't, um, I, you know, I wouldn't increase the dose to, to, um, 240 on an off-label um, thing. You know, we did that in the setting of a single patient 
protocol for, for that gentleman and, and it didn't work. So I do think that um, what was very important as we're, as you know, we talked about is, is looking um, for the, for acquired resistance mutations in patients that progress. Um, and, and the other reason that we really need to do tumor biopsies at progression or at least liquid biopsies is because we don't know why a majority of patients progress on the RET-specific inhibitors. So we've seen these acquired resistance alterations in a minority of patients so far. Um, so um, there's some other mechanism for, for acquired resistance. Um, and by acquired resistance, I mean, you know, patients who respond and remain in response for a, a period of time and then progress, not de novo resistance. Um, so, you know, there's something going on there that we really need to understand in order to continue to improve therapies um, and, and uh, still have to figure out what it is. Great. Um, Laura, you had mentioned the size of the molecule. Can you comment on that and why that's important? Well, um, the re yeah, the reason why it's important is because um, you know it needs to get into the kinase, sneak into the kinase domain, um, in order to um, have carry out the inhibition. Um, and these acquired resistance mutations basically create steric hindrance to um, the drug getting into that kinase domain or or, or binding there. Um, and so um, the um, so the TP, TPX uh, drug is a lot smaller than prostatinib and and uh, and salpicatinib, so it can get in uh, um, into the kinase domain kind of around the steric hindrance of that um, solvent front um, mutation. Um, but then again, as Alan pointed out, it, it really doesn't um, have activity in um, when there's the acquired gatekeeper resistance mutation at V804. And so one of the tricky problems that, um, that um, the companies have had um, in developing an even better RET-specific inhibitor is developing one drug that can um, get all of the wild-type RET, all of the RET, mutated RETs, um, and then and then overcome the acquired resistance mutations at GA10, 09, and 08. Um, so they've been able to come up with drugs that can do all of all of the above except 804 or 810. But they, they've not been able to figure out how to create a drug that can do everything. Great. Um, could you comment on what the um, how often you see red fusion mutations in ATC and uh, poorly dip? Um, yes, it's uncommon for sure. Um, most of the um, large NGS analyses of, of people with uh, poorly differentiated anaphylactic thyroid cancers um, have not shown, have not revealed RET fusions. Now, is that because um, an assay was used that looked for the most common fusions, but not the more uncommon ones, or was it um, because it's 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 so rare? I think you know we're, we there there have now been cases that have been reported, um, but I think it certainly is in the single digit percentage. And you know I don't you know. So the most common um, actionable alteration in, in anaplastic thyroid cancer is in is in BRAF. Um, is that because thyroid cancers that have RET fusions are more indolent um, and less likely to de-differentiate and into poorly differentiated and anaplastic, or is it just because it's just more uncommon? I don't know that we know the answer to that question. And I have a skewed reference because. I see patients with RET fusion thyroid cancer, and they're all bad, um, but that's just because <laughs> those are all the patients. I only see bad thyroid cancer patients. Great. Um, Alan, do you have a different view on that or a different experience? No, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, it, RET rearrangements and differentiate thyroid cancer, you know, in our series of like recurring metastatic patients is, you know, at best five or six percent, you know, so you're already starting out. <laughs> with a fairly low instance with recurrent metastatic disease, and then in anaplastic, it's more like one to two percent of our of our of our anaplastics. Um, it, the same can be said with you know track rearrangements as well. So, um, you know, we have had similar experiences with targeting these alterations and, and great clinical efficacy, but they're just not terribly uh, common. 
Um, you know, and you know, m many of these, of course, are rearrangements that could be radiation induced, and you see higher rates of these, of course, with in patients with have thyroid cancer from radiation exposure, those in, in, in the, the Chernobyl experience, you know, shows higher rates of these. Uh, but, you know, in the general population that we see, uh, the rates of the rearrangements are just much lower. So in the, in the final 60 seconds for either one of you or both, um, do we expect that all patients who, in whom um, we are using targeted therapy, that ultimately they will acquire resistance? Um, and if that's the case, um, when in the course of the illness or the, the treatment do you begin to look at uh, future, strategy, future strategies on an individual basis? Do you have to wait till they um, show signs of resistance or do you begin the process of looking for the next targeted therapy during the course of their illness or their response? You know, we always get encouraged in oncology when we see patients with complete responses. Um, and, uh, you know, does that mean um, that patients can remain in complete response um, forever? Um, I, I, it's really, you know, it's hard to imagine that when patients have a, such a large burden of disease that they've got structural metastatic disease um, that with all of those billions of cancer cells, we can kill every single one of them with, with a drug. Um, you know, I do think that there's um, a lot of interest in studying these very um, potent and well-tolerated drugs in the adjuvant setting in order to really perhaps try to improve on, on cure rates. Um, and in MTC, we've got a great um, patient population in whom we could ask that question in patients who um, in the post-operative setting are disease free except have uh, rising calcitonin and CEA double, with doubling times in, in the range of one under one or two years and, and we know that those patients don't do well um, and so it may be in that setting where we can really um, change the disease course well enough in, in patients so that they can really we can improve cure rates um, I guess I've, I have to you know I've it's hard for a medical oncologist, I think, to to really believe that when people have widely metastatic disease, that our drugs work so well that we can cure them. Great. Well, listen. On that note, um, Alan, if you could uh, turn on the music as we uh, close this session, I'd really appreciate it. But in any event, um, we are at the uh, at the nine o'clock hour, and um, I really want to take this opportunity to thank both of you for really outstanding and very stimulating presentations here. Uh, so as always, I wish everybody stay safe and hope that you will join us again next week. Um, and thanks once again to, uh, to Laurie and Ellen. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you.